Okay, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Alan McLean, uh, VE3RET, and uh, I've been asked to uh, provide you with instruction in regards to uh, radio frequency interference and uh, safety. So, the first section we're going to talk about is safety, and uh, what I'm not going to do is teach the book. So I'm not going to read the book for you. You can read the book. So there's no point in me sitting and reading the book and then you look at what I'm reading and say, yeah, he's reading it properly. I hate that kind of instruction and it don't work that way. So, first thing we're going to talk about is uh, safety of, of your station when you're setting it up. Most of your uh, radio equipment is going to operate on AC or DC through a power supply. You know all about power supplies if you go through that section. The important thing to remember is how your house is set up. Your wiring in your house is typically 120 volts. So essentially, I'm trying to do this for memory now. You have your three wires. And it uh, comes in through your transformer. Look just to make sure it's steadily accurate. You're going to use one and then have your eraser later. Radio frequency interference. Oh, so 16. 16. Yeah, there it is. Okay. wires, your red and your black wire, you have 230 volts approximately, 240 to 30, so we'll call it 240, and your white wire, which is your neutral. So most stuff in your house doesn't use 230, you're using your 120 volts. So your 120 volts can be obtained by either connecting between the red wire and the white wire, or between the black wire and the white wire. You can pull it off either side of the transformer. Sometimes they'll do this so that they don't overload one, one circuit and the other. So it's not, it's not uncommon, some houses, to have half of your host wired across these wires and the other half across this side. The important thing to remember is that there's power on both these lines, red and black. They both, they both can cause injury if, if they come in contact with anything that's grounded. So you've got to watch that. Typically, you have your, your AC outlet, because your two outlets 
plus your little brown plug, your safety plug. So those three wires, they would be distributed to your in the pot, which is a uh, black. Let's say that would be black. And then this would be your red. And then this would be your neutral and brown. It's typically the case. Hmm? Hmm? They uh, use black and, uh, and white. Yes, I'm going to get to Not that. Not black and red, because you got there, you yeah. got 240 volts. Yes, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to oh, that. Okay. This is how it comes in. But later on, all you're going to see is your white, your black, and you're going to see maybe the green, or you're going to see a, just a wire, bare wire. And that's, that's going to be your ground. So, in wearing your panel at a certain point, the red, your red wire becomes a white wire when it's being wired. Important thing to remember is that there's essentially power on either one of these lines. Don't forget it, because if you get the right ground between you and one of the two wires, you're going to get shot. Now, in the old days, they didn't have this sort of wire, which signals your fuse, you know, and, and blows up as soon as it is it gets a sharp test. Everybody knows about the GFIs and so on. Some fault interrupters. <coughs> Same idea. In the old days, they used to wire the, your radios, <coughs> they used to have your AC come into it transformers and so on and running. And the other wire was connected right to the chassis of the radio. So be aware, if you ever are working on older equipment, pre-1960s vintage stuff, that chassis is hot. So you gotta be careful. Some people rewire them and they just because they it actually connects right to the chassis. Some people will rewire them, they'll take that take that off and they'll Fix it up, and they'll make sure that the chassis is, is no longer hot if, if they rebuild them. But you got to be aware that some of this old equipment. When you ever see two prongs on a piece of hand gear, watch out because this might be hot. It's a good idea to, to plug it in carefully and check it with your meter because you, you might have a hot piece of equipment there. So what you're saying is that coming into the house, the white wire is, is ground. And the and at the receptacle, it could be live. Yeah, and at some point, this this well, white, white wire, wire won't be actually live. becomes a, a, a bare wire. Your uh, your wire. The side. white wire is never live. Yeah. Oh, so on that diagram, this is the ground. That's the ground. Turns yeah, it's never so. live. Yeah, but what's happening is this is in the fuse box. Yeah. But after that, they they change the, the convention. Once yeah. it comes out of the fuse box, yeah. You got your white wire, your black wire, yeah. and then your third wire is uh, is is ground wire. And it's usually either uh, green or it's or it's a, a wrapped or, it's oh, uh, wrapped around and it's uh, just a solid piece of co of uh, copper right. built white, into the, the built white, into the harness. The white wire and, and the ground wire both the same on the panel. They both go to ground on the panel. Not exactly. Yes, they do. Not exactly. You, you sure about that? That there's no potential there's difference a, whatsoever? No, no, they both go to ground. Okay. All right, maybe I'm wrong here. Uh, this is a little bit out of my area, <laughs> this one here. Um, but the important thing to remember is uh, that uh, you don't want to be touching these things with the power zone. So if you're ever going to mess around with this stuff, always turn your power off. If you can. If you can't, wear heavy leather gloves and work with one hand. Put one hand in the pocket if you can. Don't work with two hands. Real bad idea. It only takes 0 0.001 of an ampere to kill you across your heart. Some batteries can generate that.
Later on, if you start playing around with uh, some of the more advanced amateur equipment, even, even radio transmitters themselves, some of the old tube gear, they use very, very high voltages. And uh, they're, 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 they're not enclosed in metal cages for no reason. So be very, very careful if you're doing any, anything like that. If you take the lid off a piece of equipment, just respect the voltage if it's, power, if it's plugged in. Also, even if it's not plugged in, which you, heard, you heard about capacitors? You know how they can hold a charge? Well, some of these old high voltage power supplies, they can hold a charge for days or weeks. And there's enough there to give you a really good zap, possibly seriously injure or kill you if it makes the right connection. So these capacitors will still hold a charge even after it's unplugged. So when you mess around with these high voltage areas, you should know what you're doing or leave it alone. Uh, one trick that is done with capacitors, you have to work on them if this is more advanced stuff, really. Is you connect a screwdriver, insulated screwdriver, on an alligator clip to the chassis of what you want, and just touch all your capacitor leads to snap, 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 until they're dead. Then there's no power in the system. But they will hold a charge. As a matter of fact, the TV tubes are, are basically big capacitors. If you grab that high voltage uh, piece that's on the side deck, up to a year after it's been turned off, you're going for a ride. <coughs> it holds a very nasty charge for a very long time. So you can't be too careful when it comes to power supplies and voltages. setting up your station, typically you're setting up your station, you have your antenna, you have your transmitter, or transceiver, these days it's all one box, I'm leaving this up. <laughs> it usually plugs into the wall directly, or it may be plugging into a power supply which plugs into the wall. And then you have your antenna. Now what you also want to do with a good proper station, you want to have what's called a station ground. So basically what you want is a common type on the ground point. A metal bar is best. A perfect ground would be to have a metal bar with a whole bunch of little connectors on it and connect one to the chassis of each piece of your helmet push. So you had a tuner after your amplifier, you would not connect everyone to that. Okay, any other devices there in the line. And then your your grounding bar should go to a good ground, preferably an earth ground, and as short as the shortest distance as possible away from your station. If you can't do that, a cold water pipe will work. In some cases, it works out well. The problem is that if you've got a long, long run of pipe, that the pipe could actually, could actually become a radiator. It could actually cause you more trouble and you're better off without a ground in that case. The radiator, in what sense? It would become, become part of your antenna system. Oh. Because the same frequency of energy is going to be traveling along that pipe, it's essentially going to radiate, oh. just like your antenna. So part of buildings, clipping to the cold water pipe will probably cause you more grief <coughs> than uh, relief because essentially you'll be, you'll have, you'll have this big antenna and you'll be going through everybody's apartment. And yeah. that means <laughs> big RFI problems. It's like running an antenna next to your neighbor's TV down the wall. So apartment buildings, this kind of ground is usually not possible. That said, you don't have to have a station ground. They, they'll work without a station ground. 
But whenever you can, it's a good idea to put it in because it can, cut, it can save you problems later. Particularly important for lightning strikes. To ground your equipment it can save you a few thousand dollars for the lightning strike. Of course, the best protection is when it's thunder and lightning out. Disconnect your cable, put it right under your ground. <coughs> what some people do is they put a, a PL259 connector, or sorry, SO, SO259, just a socket style. They mount that right to the ground bar. So when they screw their coax on, it's grounded both the shield and the center. And that's a perfect ground. But if you forget, this might save you too. It's also, also a good idea to make sure that all your equipment is connected to a surge protected outlet. That's also a good idea. So basically, uh, you really should use only surge protected power bars in your equipment. You should know that already. You shouldn't be doing that with your, with your computers and your, uh, your trend, your, uh, all your other pieces of equipment in your house. The other thing to keep in mind is it's a good idea not to use the same power bar. If you can, keep your, your amateur equipment on a separate AC outlet that's not part of the other. That also eliminates the problem of if there is a strike, that it's going to bleed into all your other equipment and affect it. It also helps to prevent interaction between other pieces of equipment. Say you had a computer plug in here, uh, it's very possible that because of this is all using the same, the same plug, the same uh, power bar, you could get interference traveling along the power bar that's all common to all, these, to all your, your the RF that's being generated by all the rest of your station. So you want to avoid that by making sure that all your other accessories go to another circuit if possible. It could save you a lot of grief in the long run if you can do that. If you can't, then we'll talk about ways of mitigating that problem pretty well. Now, a lot of people think that lightning strikes from the, from the, from the, from the air and comes down. And a lot of people thought that, and it's not correct. And that, that's why a lot of people have a real hard time understanding lightning. Lightning does not come out of the sky. Lightning goes into the sky. Think of it this way. You have a hose and you're putting out water. Does the water get thinner the further it gets away, or does it spread out? It always sprays it. It always gets wider than the hose, right? Same thing with lightning. Lightning starts at a tiny point, and it spreads out. That's why lightning... Always going like that. For example, it's always wider than the sky end. And that's why you always see these little pinpoints. And if you look down, you'll see your... There's always like a, a point. When you look at lightning, you see that it's, it's, it's got a, a point to it. It's not striking like this. It's striking at a particular point. You look across the horizon, you'll see the little streaks. That's because it's not going down. It's going up. The reason it's going up is because the ground is the ultimate negative potential. And the clouds are your positive. And we know from our, from our earlier electronics that electrons move, protons don't. Well, they, they can be forced to, but basically, if they have a choice, it's the electron that's going to move first, right? Well, these are your electrons, these are your protons. Which one's going to move when there's a potential difference? The electrons. So if the electrons are seeking to, dis to equalize into the sky. Now, once we, un once we understand that, now we can see how lightning protection can work for us. Because the idea of lightning protection is to prevent a strike. The strike only occurs when you have a potential difference that's big enough for it to, to jump across the gap. 
Lightning protection tries to eliminate the buildup of the potential difference. And they do that in some very interesting ways. One of the most common lightning protection people have seen over the years are these funny little poles that used to sit on top of the barns. Kind of look like this, with a little point on them. Remember those? Everybody says, those are lightning rods. Well, they are. But if you looked at one real close, you find out they're sharpened to a point. They're not like this. They're like this. Why? Because they want a tiny little point of discharge. So the trick is, these things are in the ground. Your sky starts building up its potential. Well, this is closer than this. So the electrons have, have a choice of either jumping all the way up here or taking the easy road. They like, they're lazy. They like to take the least resistance. They come up to here. When they reach this little point, it's the closest. That's where they're going to start to develop. But because this is a tiny little point, it basically tries to restrict the, the amount of electrons that can move at once. So if it starts early enough, all you'll just see is maybe just a little, a little spray, a little, kind of like a tiny little spark. And you may have seen it uh, if you look prior to a lightning strike or something, or um, a storm. Every now and then you look in the dark and you see these tiny little streaks that come off the light. There's no real strike, but you just see these tiny little, they're just like this free of water that comes out, little, little tiny. If you get real close, you can't hear it. That's protecting the rest of the structure. Because as long as it doesn't allow this to build up and can slowly bleed off the charge from that small little point, then there's no lightning strike. The strike occurs when there's so much potential between two points that it violently jumps. And once the current starts to flow at that levels, it basically melts everything until it's all gone. And that's what will happen in a major lightning strike. But enough of these in an area will keep that potential to the point where it'll, it'll, it'll choose to bleed slowly as opposed to one big jump. Now another neat thing about lightning protection is that it effectively protects a 45 degree cone. So if you have a lightning rod or, or a higher point, anything that's underneath this cone is more or less protected. It's not perfect, but 98% of the chance it's just going to bleed off and this is going to be unaffected. So basically, if you have a neighbor that's complaining about your tower, says it's going to attract lightning, you can come back to them and say, well, no, actually, it's protecting your house. Because you're under that cone, and this is going to bleed off the charge, so it's not going to strike your TV, it's not going to blow your cell. You should be glad that my tower is that tough. <laughs> so that uh, theory then of uh, electron flow has been around for a long time then because mm -hmm. the yep. lightning rods have been around a long time, that's for sure. Yep, and that's one way of, of, of utilizing it. But you'd be surprised how many people still think lightning comes out of the sky. Watching too many cartoons, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, there are certain times that it certainly appears that way. It appears that way, yes. Sheet lightning, especially. Well, it's all the time, yeah. What sheet lightning is, is a whole bunch of discharges all at the same time from a wide area. You'll see that sometimes where there's no there's no high points, say like a golf course. No high points. But the potential is just so high that basically it all comes all at the same time. Rare. You see that. That's why golf carts are particularly dangerous because where it would normally do this, you give it something closer, guess where it all goes to? So that highest point of a line is still, in an open field, is still valid. Oh yes, yes. It's, it's all, but it's, it's all it's chopped down to resistance. There's a greater resistance between the sky and this point than there is here. It's rather, it's rather travel along the wire and go this way. 
And in this case, if it was going to build up enough potential sooner or later to actually give you a sheet, if there's something here to make it easier, that's where it's going to go. The best uh, way of connecting the station ground is to use braided wire. Braided wire has uh, some unique properties that, that uh, will uh, dissipate the charge as opposed to being concentrated and melt the wire away from the strike. Uh, example being uh, braided wire would be like your coax cable, you with your coax T cable, you have your solid end, and then you've got your braided shield that's around that. Well, that's a braided, that's a braided wire. You can vibrate in different lengths and uh, purchase it that way. But what most hams do is they take some old coax they strip it all off, they cut it to the length they want, they throw away the mid, the mid section, and they just flatten out the braid, and it makes great grounding cables. And then that, that's what you would connect between your, your station and each of your, your ground points. It's real flexible, and uh, it's much more efficient. Oh yes, if you happen to be curious and like to play around with electronics like I did when I was a kid, uh, if you're going to play with stuff, don't play with it on the basement floor, not on your bare feet, that's even worse. If you're going to work on stuff, put it on the bench, rubber mat, you know, the minimum rubber running shoes. Uh, don't uh, play with uh, like electronics while standing on cement floor, stocking feet, or whatever. Bad idea. Don't do it. Another thing to be concerned about with antennas. station, you're all set, and you're going to build up, put up your first antenna. <coughs> a couple things you need to be aware of. Everybody's seen these along the street, I believe. I think transformers on them, up high, called power lines. And some people even notice that uh, they kind of uh, run lines to your houses. Sometimes through your backyard, other houses, uh, all kinds of possibilities. These are very, very dangerous. And what you do not want to do is be erecting an antenna that in the process of going up, touches one of these lines. It'll kill you. Okay? So make sure when you're putting up any antenna structure, it's away from the power lines. Don't just think, oh, it's going to happen to somebody else. Because it will happen to you. Give, give those power lines lots and lots of respect. And if you're putting up a dipole antenna, and you have a choice of gaining a few feet by going over a power line, as opposed to under the power line, go under. Take my advice and go under. Take the hit. Because this other hit is much worse. If that line should break in a windstorm, come down, it will discharge into all your equipment and anything else that happens to be in contact with it. And that's not a pleasant uh, result. So I can't stress that enough. When you're putting something up, you're working on a tower, know where those power lines are and stay the heck away from them. There's another little phenomenon that's quite interesting I ran into once about power lines. They do radiate, you know, because they are they are AC current, they're high voltage, they do create a magnetic field. I had a situation years ago, back when I was playing with CB radios. A guy called me one day and he said, 
I brought this to everybody. He says, nobody can tell me what's going on. He says, every time I buy a radio, I hook it up to my, my station. He says, and within a couple of minutes, it's got no receipt. No matter what radio it is, you know, five different radios, he says, within a few minutes, no receipt. You take it to them and say, the, the preamp's blown. The RF preamp's blown. Could, nobody could figure out what was going on. So, I went up, looked at the situation, looked around it, and uh, I noticed that when I disconnected the puck, his antenna, there was a slight spark from the center connector of the uh, of the coax as I took it off the radio. And I thought that was kind of strange. So I decided to put a volt meter on that and see what I got. 117 volts across the shield in the uh, center conductor. Now, how could that be possible? My first thought was that somehow he's got to connect it connected to power lines. But there's no connection to power lines. So there's only one other possibility. He was surrounded by so many power lines that the voltage was being induced into his antenna system from the electromagnetic field of the power lines. And we proved this. So that's another way that you can get a little surprise. So if you see a lot of power lines in the area, high tension, you have to watch for that. You may have to put some kind of a, of a lead off circuit before it goes to your radio to, to, to get rid of that kind of a problem. What would you do? I built them a lead off circuit off <laughs> the discharge at filter. And it was a combination of uh, some, uh, some uh, bypass capacitors and a, and a circuit uh, tuned to uh, block 120 to 20 hertz between the two of them. But it's one of those weird little things you run into, or you don't run into, but just be aware of the power lines, even if you don't touch them, there can be a possibility of shocks from, from just something being near it. So if you're next to a like, power station, that's a little bit. Yes. Don't hang your dipole. Yeah. Also, if you're in that kind of a situation and the power lines are running this way, if you can, don't put your dipole this way. Put it this way. That will minimize the amount of magnetic field that will be induced to create a problem like that. Just a little pointer you might want to consider when you're setting things up. Another concern that you will run into is try not to put your antenna systems down where people can get a, get a hold of them. Because they do put out some pretty nasty uh, side effects. Basically, your basic dipole antenna, you have your, your feed line, your insulator, and you have your two lines. <clears throat> the voltage that can be produced at the ends when you're transmitting, at even as low as uh, Two or three hundred watts is can be in the thousands of volts, and if somebody happens to grab your antenna system because they thought it'd be cool to grab it, uh, they can uh, get a nasty shock, and they also can get very serious RF burns. The radio frequency energy will really give a nasty burn. So you want to keep these high enough in a way so nobody can get up there and grab them. We'll keep them. Uh, 15, 20 feet minimum, so kids can't get and think it'd be cool to touch them. I saw, I saw a video yesterday, actually, by coincidence, and these kids in Russia were going to an AM antenna, like it was like bell-shaped, and getting blades of grass and holding it on the thing, and it was playing what was on the radio through the thing. And I was wondering if it was real, and then I looked it up, and like in, in the comments of people were saying it was real. Like that was actually, like I, I don't know how it was converting it to sound from the signal, but I'll show the video after during the break, but mm -hmm. like it, it was so like that, like that. How does that work? Like, do you well, that's a little extreme for what I see. I have to know what kind of grass it was. I yeah, I imagine it has a pretty high. It was just long grass, and they were just like, you know, I'll find the video after on the book mark, but they were just holding it up to that, and then it was fizzing away and burning, but as that was happening, you were hearing what 
like some radio station like people thought. And, and, okay, yeah. Uh, let me put it this way: the very first time uh, that I uh, was inspecting a uh, an AM radio station, it was very high power. I was coming up to the shacks, and I could hear the broadcast station coming from all the shacks. And I thought, oh, look at all these monitor speakers in there. Said, no, no, there's no speakers in there. I said, but I can hear these things. He says, no, no, that's the vib that's the coils vibrating in the transmitters. <laughs> <laughs> same, con same concept. The uh, radio frequency generator is so powerful inside these things that the coils would actually physically vibrate and they would act like loudspeakers. So what you're getting in this case is you have a, your blade of grass is close to it. It's getting RF energy induced into it, and it's vibrating at the frequency of the uh, of the RF. Um, and you know how amplitude? Yeah, yeah. And sure. you're getting zapped. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like sure. I thought it was fake at first. I didn't know. Nope. Like, I was like, how does no, it go into actual like, sound? But, no, it's valid. Yeah, it's yeah it can happen. I don't recommend it. No, no. That's what the, <laughs> all the comments said. Especially if the grass like, is wet when you're holding it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, just, just being that close to that kind of RF. Really. Oh, that's what, they, that's what they said. They were like, those kids are just dumb yeah. for being like it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's that too. I wonder how they found out. <laughs> That's just a grass. I don't know. <laughs> no, maybe they, some grass grew close to it. Yeah, they listened to it. Let's try again. Yeah. Then that night they yeah. just felt really weird. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, think, so that's important to know about that for safety on that. Um, so for that, you don't have to touch both ends for the instrument You just have to touch the Grab any, any point here, you're going to get an RF right card on this one. It's going to get more severe. Oh, okay, so it's an RF burn. It's not like getting the discharge from the shell. No, it's going to be an RF burn. It's going to be like putting your hands in my ears. Oh, okay. Here we go. It's going to burn. I feel like something's hot. Yeah. Yeah. So don't do it. Okay. <laughs> Now, if you're going to do tower work, you should always have a, have a, use an approved climbing belt. If you don't have one, borrow one. There are lots of them around. But make sure that uh, you take all the proper safety precautions. You start doing your high antennas and things like that, setting stuff up. Make sure you get the right safety equipment. Don't cut corners. It isn't worth it. There are lots of stories out there about people who cut corners. Oh, it'll just be a five-minute trip up the tower. I don't need to put on my belt. <laughs> no. Oh. Lightning arresters. There are a couple of other things you can do to protect yourself besides the grounds I mentioned. There are devices called lightning arresters, or sometimes they call them blitz pucks. You can buy them. They're designed to go right inside uh, between your coax and your antenna. You have a little line on them that goes to your common ground. Inside, they either have a little gas discharge uh, module that is destroyed when it gets a strike and breaks the circuit. Uh, or they will have two tiny little pinpoint points. This will pass RF, but it will block your, uh, your lightning and force it to go down to the ground. These are good to have, but I have them in all my lines. They're not expensive, they're easy to install. And if you have a good ground, I highly recommend you get a set of these and them all your grounds. Just that little extra insurance. Um, as far as antennas, uh, depending on the significance of your antenna, you may or may not require uh, approval to construct, construct your antenna. Uh, there's a document uh, the department puts out, it's called the uh, Radio Antenna and Supporting Structures, uh, CPC 2-0-03, it's available on the website. And under that document, most amateur equipment or most amateur installations are exempted because they're usually under a certain number of uh, certain height. 
but sometimes you run into uh, conflicts with municipalities. Uh, but in that case, uh, you may have to consult between the municipality and the department, and they may or may not get involved. But essentially, if it's 18 meters and less, you're, you're pretty well okay. Another thing to consider is you remember that these, these antennas, they radiate RF energy. And there's a level for that. What you don't want to do is get these antennas too close to your neighbor's property if you can possibly avoid it, especially if you're going to run high power. Because the more the closer you get to their property, the more chances that you're going to affect their other equipment and you're going to have problems. So you try to keep them up above, away, or, you know, uh, and that limit, limits the problem if it, if it does show up. In the case of a, of a situation where such, a, such interference would occur, and if the department got involved, what would happen is the department would come in, they would take uh, measurements, and they would go to the, where the, the location of the device is being affected. They would determine the field strength. Uh, and if the field strength was under a certain number, then they would say it's the fault of the equipment owned by the, the, uh, the neighbor. Uh, and if it was above a certain level, then they would say that you're going to have to turn your power down or make other adjustments to make sure that that doesn't occur <coughs> again. The thing is, you have to live with your neighbors. So, the thing is, what you want to do is Try not to upset the neighbors. And uh, if you learn of a problem, if you don't know what to, you don't know what you're doing, consult your local ham community, work out a strategy, and get some help with somebody before you approach your neighbor. And if they ask you to shut it down for five days, you got. Thing is, you have a narrow window to work with neighbors. Typically, um, they have so much patience. Um, because as far as they're concerned, they're living your life, and you're doing something to interfere with their life. They don't care about rules, regulations, license, all that. That doesn't mean anything to them. So if you can give them a clear uh, um, procedure or, to do, or, or demonstrate something that's going to work, and they will, they will work with you for a little while, but after two or three failures, they're not interested. As far as they're concerned, the problem is simple, shut it down. And then they go look for a lawyer to get it done. And it's been done. So you don't want to go there. You want to be, make sure that you run a good clean station and that you take seriously the complaints and try and work through them. Sometimes it's even worth your while to buy the person another radio. Just stay here. Please. I'll buy you. This radio won't be affected. Maybe it'll cost you 50 or $60. It's cheaper than spending two years in court and losing a neighbor. Here's a friend. I've done that several times. Clock radios are the worst. Clock radios, if you ever really have a problem and someone's got a clock radio and they just, they, I gotta have their clock radio and they're not gonna let you know, anything. When you want a problem to go away, get them a Tivoli. There's a company called Tivoli. They're, they're, the radials are expensive though. They run between uh, uh, 60 to 120 bars. AM, FM, clock radio. They're rock solid. And problem solved. How do you spell Tivoli? T I V O L L I. As a last resort, when you know you're about to lose. Is that what you most typically interfere with with a radio signal versus like cordless phones? Or is that a problem for you? I'm going to get into our interference in a minute. I'm probably going to take a break before I do that. I'm just going to make sure I've got it. Just keep going. Three lines, come back. Safety code six. Yeah, safety code six. 
Uh, as you'll find in the regulations, all industries are required to adhere to safety code six. What that means is that you don't have a station that, uh, as a result of its operation, creates RF fields that exceed the safety code six guidelines. There's a formula for it. Uh, basically, if a person is not is not really close to your antenna and you're not operating over a thousand watts, chances are safety code six won't be a concern. Uh, however, if you have a beam antenna that's pointed into your next neighbor's picture window on the second floor, then you might have to do some calculations to find out if there's a problem there. Especially if you start running that to running uh, 5,000 or 3,000 watt linear or something like that. It can get dicey. Okay, soldering. Anybody work with soldering irons? You know they get real hot. It's pretty straightforward, and, but we'll just mention that these things, uh, if you're going to use these soldering irons, uh, make sure you keep an eye on where, where they are. And uh, remember, these things are really hot, even though they don't glow red. They will cause very serious burns if you come in contact with the tip of that thing when it's hot very quickly. It'll be a little sizzling sound when you're touching. You can throw yourself a little like tip, <laughs> tip that, that blood on it too. It's yeah, not really that's not going to be good either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not going to be good either. It's not a just the skin black line. And if you're doing meticulous work where you've got to get your eyes down, safety glasses. Even the even your regular solder that has your uh, your um, flux in it has been known to bubble and throw bits of hot flux where it's not supposed to go. The fumes aren't good for you either. Yeah. Fumes aren't even good for you either. Yes. everything in regards to uh, safety and uh, you know, any questions? Okay, so we're timing. Good. We're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll do our radio frequency interference.